This episode of AK Rex has been brought to you by the mega awesome Tyrannosaurus Resin Kit. Why is it awesome? Because we love dinosaurs, that is why. Why is it super duper mega awesome? Because Tyrannosaurus and because you want to let your friends know about the super duper natural awesomeness of Tyrannosaurus. <clears throat> uh, yes, you do want to let your friends know. To get your own resin kit of Tyrannosaurus Rex, please uh, use one of the details given here in the description box or right here on the screen. Thank you very much and enjoy the episode. Talk to you later. Uh, hello everybody, it's uh, AKRX channel here and we have a special guest today with us, uh, none other than Dr. Thomas Carr. How are you today, Tom? How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you doing today? Uh, very good indeed and uh, I am excited because I've been waiting to have a chat for a long time. Are you excited? I am very much and thanks for having me on. Lovely. So, um, could you uh, tell us a little bit uh, about yourself and where you're from? Yes, I'm a vertebrate paleontologist. I got my PhD from the University of Toronto in 2005, and I've been working at Carthage College, which is a small liberal arts college in, in Wisconsin, where I am the director of the Carthage Institute of Paleontology. Uh, we have a lab, a prep lab, in the basement of the Dinosaur Discovery Museum, which is in downtown Kenosha. And just about every summer, we do field work in southeastern Montana to collect dinosaur fossils and fossils of plants and other organisms from the Hell Creek Formation. So I have an active uh, field and research program going here in southeastern Wisconsin. And uh, I also have a paleo track for undergraduate students who might be interested in becoming paleontologists. And my program is designed to train undergraduate students for graduate school. Awesome. Awesome. That's That sounds like quite a story and uh, uh, I'm pretty sure my viewers would be already in awe hearing this alone. So, and we've still got quite a lot ahead. <laughs> now, um, uh, one other thing that quite a few people have asked me uh, was uh, how uh, did it happen that you became interested in uh, dinosaurs and then subsequently how did you, uh, like what happened when you decided to become a paleontologist and pursue it as a profession? That's a good question. It started when I was two years old, according to my mother. According to my mother <laughs> uh, I had... Uh, uh, I think a Gold Key dinosaur book. So it was this company called Gold Key made dinosaur books and books on other aspects of nature. And at two, apparently I was enchanted with that. And as a kid, I always remember being interested in Tyrannosaurus rex. And as a matter of fact, it's Tyrannosaurus rex and its closest relatives, the Tyrannosauroids, that I study as my primary research um, focus. That interest in dinosaurs did wane um, in my early teens, but then it was revived in 1978 by the National Geographic cover article on dinosaurs that featured work of uh, paleontologists such as John Ostrom establishing that connection, that evolutionary connection between dinosaurs and birds. And there are some fantastic illustrations in there, including illustrations of Deinonychus, a rather dramatic painting of one running, and that really woke my interest back up again. And two years later, I found myself in southern Alberta volunteering for the Tyrrell Museum of Paleontology. I was a volunteer for a couple weeks out there, and I remember very clearly there was a moment where I was walking through camp, which was a bunch of, of trailers and a walkway, and I was walking down the walkway, and I had this epiphany, uh, where visually everything became crystal clear, and I realized that I had arrived at my life, at my future, and it was in that moment where I realized that paleontology, vertebrate paleontology, dinosaurs in particular, were something I, that I would commit my life to, and I, hadn't, I haven't looked back since then. Now, there's a bit of a, of a final point to this. And that is, how did I wind up working on Tyrannosaurs, of all things? Um, the year was 1988. I was, I think, 18 years old at the time. And I had a copy of the Nanotrans paper by Bakker et al. And 
I had a long-standing interest in dromaeosaurids. I had a copy of John Ostrom's monograph by that time as well. And I remember staying in my living room, uh, looking at the Ostrom monograph and the Neotrans paper, and realizing that I had to make a decision regarding which group I would pursue uh, in academically. And it's important, I think, to make these sorts of decisions fairly early. And so at, eight, so at, at 18 years old, um, having read through both works, I realized that Tyrannosaurus had the better sample size. So for each major species and genus, there's a growth series. And so that was a very easy decision to make. Um, since the sample sizes of Tyrannosaurus at that time were much better than what we have for Dromaeosaurids. And arguably, Tyrannosaurids are still a little bit further ahead than Dromaeosaurids in terms of sample size. And so I haven't regretted that decision. And uh, Tyrannosaurids have been pretty good to me career-wise, and there's no end in sight, I'm happy to say. That's amazing. I mean, um, uh, I, I like this part, especially where you said that you, as soon as you stepped in the camp and it just went like boom immediately to you that you realized that was it. It's like, it's like you fell in love, but not quite with the person, but with uh, the with the feeling, with the atmosphere or with the vibe, I guess. It was slightly different kind of, but it's the same sensation maybe perhaps, but like it, it had a very different sort of uh, idea, more like in yourself rather than uh, in you know in something in relation to the outside you know what i mean like yeah, uh, yeah i i know what you I, I know what you mean exactly because i think i may have experienced something like that a few times but uh, the first few times i was just too well you know ignorant to it so well things happen <laughs> yeah yeah but yeah so i mean that's awesome i, I love the story so uh, dare i assume that tyrannosaurus is your favorite dinosaur well my favorite <laughs> my favorite dinosaur is whichever one that I'm working on at the current time. And so right now I happen to be working on the Jane monograph. So Jane, as many of, of your listeners probably know, is a subadult T-Rex. It was collected by the Burpee Museum in Rockford, Illinois. And I'm the lead author on that project. And so right, sorry about that, guys. There was a bit of a lag going on with the program. So, uh, uh, sorry, Dr. Carr, you said that you were w currently already involved in a project with a uh, uh, juvenile Tyrannosaurus, right? Yes. So I'm working on a book-length description of, of Jane, um, which is a sub-adult T-Rex at the Burpee Museum in Rockford, Illinois. They collected the specimen, but I'm the lead author on the project. So T-Rex right now is my favorite Tyrannosaur. In January, I'll be at the Museum of the Rockies to work on Displetosaurus horneri on another monograph. And so in January, horneri will be my favorite Tyrannosaur. T-Rex will take a back seat at that time. So it's basically going to be a fair share for everybody, not going to be like, you know, freebies for one, but the other one has to kind of wait in the queue. So it will be all swapping around a little bit. Yes. Yeah, it's inherently unstable. Now, uh, you have uh, uh, done a very nice logical transition to the next point in our program. And uh, uh, this is basically where the second part comes in right now. And that is going to be the Splitosaurus Horn arrived from Caratal 2017. So, uh, let's uh, start off about just a few general things. So, how long have we actually known about uh, the Splitosaurus Horneri's existence before the uh, published paper was released in 2017. How long has it actually been known uh, for in the paleontological circles? Yeah, it's been, it's been known in the literature since 1992. A long time. A very long time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it was at the time regarded as a a new taxon, a new species, it wasn't named, and it was presented in the context of being a transitional species between the Splitosaurus terosus and T-Rex. And so there was very little description given to it, uh, just a few salient features that showed that it might be intermediate between terosus and Rex, uh, but really not much since that, since that time. However, in that 
span of time from 92 uh, to recent years, many new specimens have been found, including a very nice adult and some subadult material. So we have a pretty clear picture of Horneri that we, sim that we simply didn't have back in 90 1992. So really the time was right now to publish on this species to give a fairly well-rounded picture of the animal. And that just simply wouldn't have been possible based on a single skull and leg that was found so long ago. Yeah, the lack of material seems to be a common issue generally in uh, describing specimens and just giving it a very accurate uh, representation. Because, yes. uh, oh yeah, like I've got a like nail, so new species. Congratulations. Right. <laughs> it's pretty yeah. much like, uh, well, we've seen it happen a lot of times already, haven't we? Yes. Um, so um, now that you have mentioned the transition between uh, the species, I would like to bring to the attention of uh, our viewers, if you don't mind, um, finding the Dasplitosaurus timeline image uh, yeah. that I have just sent you. Have you got it in front of you right here? I do. So uh, now my next uh, question would be, let's talk about, uh, obviously a lot of these things that uh, I'm going to ask are mainly for my viewers more so sure. than for myself. So uh, let's talk about Dasplitosaurus torosus versus Horneri. What can we really say about the similarities, the differences, and whatever is relevant in that uh, particular subject? Yeah, well, Displaceosaurus prosus uh, was geologically older, um, and that's what the diagram shows. R roughly, it lived between 76.7 to 75.2 million years ago, and it had, relative to Horneri, uh, it looks like it had a fairly uh, lower skull, a shallower skull. Horneri has a, a taller skull frame, and Trosus also has more prominent horns than Horneri does. Tyrannosaurus have usually a set, three sets of horns on their faces, one in front of the eye, one behind, and one that extends from, uh, from the cheek. And the one above the eye, the lacrimal horn, is quite uh, taller in Tyrannosaurus than Horneri. And this difference in height is seen in the subadults and, uh, and adults. So this isn't just based on on, say, comparing one Tyrosus to one Horneri. So we're pretty confident about that difference. And in addition to those features, there's, there's a lot uh, more, there's a whole suite of much more subtle features that differentiate the two species. But I think the height of the skull frame and the size of the horns are the most outstanding differences that I think your audience can appreciate from these diagrams. Awesome. So, yes, I mean, um, uh we have this uh, very obvious, uh, I mean, it's not really obvious unless you really read into it, but there's like a hundred thousand years gap between them. So is there, uh, what in your opinion this gap could represent? Could there be something in between that uh, could have happened as well and we just don't have enough uh, data to test it? Or could there be literally just, well, there couldn't be nothing, right? So there must have been something in between that gap. <laughs> Yeah, well, just to, to take a step back, what we hypothesized was that even though we can tell the two species apart, it doesn't mean that the speciation process was a splitting event. And what a, a classic spe splitting event is that an ancestral population splits into two descendants, and those two descendants are differentiated by natural selection. So they look different, right, after that initial speciation event. But in this case, um, at least from the limited geological picture we have, it looks like the Trosis, well, our, the evidence does show Trosis was an earlier Tyrannosaur than Horneri. Horneri was a younger animal, geologically speaking, from about 75 to 74 million years ago. And so what that does is open up the possibility that, tr that it wasn't a splitting speciation event. It was effectively a continuous one. And that's called anagenesis. The splitting version is called cladogenesis. That's what I was going to lead up to as well, yeah, anagenesis. It's, and, is, it, is it quite common, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but is it quite common sure. to observe this um, uh, event happen in the dinosaur, you know, evolutionary history? Well, it's quite common for 
um, invertebrates, uh, but it's not documented very frequently for dinosaurs. It has been suggested for some hadrosaurs and ceratopsians recently. And basically, there's a few criteria that have to be fulfilled to float the idea. So, for example, the two species have to be successive in time and not overlap. This is the case with the Splitosaurus trosus and Horneri. They also have to live on the same landmass, or at least be at in adjacent landmasses. And both of these animals are from Laramidia. And their evolutionary relationships cannot conflict with those other patterns. And it turns out that they are each other's closest relative. So the evidence lines up to at least suggest that maybe anagenesis was at work here. And what that means is that Displetosaurus trosus morphed into Displetosaurus horneri through the action of natural selection. And so what that gap of 100,000 years uh, represents is um, the time separation between horneri and trosis. And if, you know, say fossils are found of Displetosaurus in that gap, we might even have a transition between the two. That would be consistent with anagenesis. So uh, I wanted to um, address a few uh, physical features of both of these um, uh, animals and uh, just wanted to say um, how are they different in general size? We know that Rosas is estimated at approximately nine or something like that meters in length. Yeah, yeah about nine meters. They're, they're the same size. They don't go upgrade or downgrade, they just change appearances, more or less. Right, and in this image, uh, the two skulls are to scale, and the Horneri skull is a sub-adult, and we do have an adult, and it's bigger than the sub-adult, and so it's closer or identical in size to the adult Trosis. So they, they're all about 9 meters long, and that 9 meter size is ancestral for Tranosaurids and possibly also for Bistahi aversor. So that nine meter length is a fairly relatively ancestral size for the for advanced Tranosauroids. Then we see another increase in size, a super size, when it comes to T-Rex and its closest relatives. But T-Rex is truly upgraded. Yeah, interesting. Um, what I find is that, uh, but see the adult skulls uh, of the adult skull of the Horneri. You said uh, that you've got it. Is it quite well preserved, or is it more fragmental compared to this one in the diagram? Well, the one in the diagram, that's the skull that was published on in '92. That's MOR 590, a fairly famous skull, and it's pretty much completely articulated. Although it is in sections, it, it, the skull can actually come apart. Um, with regard to the adult, which is MOR 1130, the skull is completely disarticulated, which is a wonderful circumstance because you can see all the features, right? Including things like sutural surfaces. Uh, one cool thing is that since the publication of our paper, additional bones of the adult have been prepared and they're now available for study. And that's what I'll be doing in January just to complete the description of the animal. Uh, previously, we didn't have all the bones, so I couldn't compare everything to 590, but now we have the brain case, we have additional bones of the palate and lower jaw, so, and also the postcranial skeleton as well. There's additional vertebrae and other bones that, that have been prepared. Um, so that's why I'm heading back in January, just to finish this description. So I'm happy to say, that even though the illustration of the adult in our paper is incomplete, it's virtually complete now. All we're missing, I think, are the premaxillae. Okay, that sounds very good indeed. Um, yeah, it, it, is. it will be definitely worth, uh, you know, having another sort of comeback, uh, you know, have another go of, uh, you know, at... words are hard today, are they not? <laughs> Uh, I was going to say have another go at uh, the um, uh, look for the Horneri just to see how it looks when you've done the analysis with all the new updated uh, information. Certainly. So let's uh, now 
uh, move to the next point on Hornerai as well. Uh, that is if you could find the uh, Dehornerai art image, and this is this very beautiful uh, illustration that was done for the paper. Yes. Have you got it? Okay, lovely. So, um, now that we've got this image right here in front of us, and the viewers are also seeing it as we speak, what can you tell us about uh, the facial integument for this guy? Because this is one of the main subjects as well in the paper, and uh, it has, of course, produced a whole series of reactions, uh, both uh, wow and some, uh, like, you know, very mixed reactions. <laughs> yes. But um, uh, my reaction was actually quite excited because it's just really interesting to know uh, more about how they looked and uh, what how they could have implemented it. So let's talk about that a little bit. And sure. um, uh, let's also, while we are at it, address maybe to see if you have brought up any additional points uh, on the latest SVP meeting uh, regarding Horneri and uh, the function of this integument and what it looks like and what it represents. So microphone to Dr. Carr. Okay. <laughs> uh, this diagram is a hypothesis and the colorized version that you're seeing uh, was for the press release and what we published was a just a grayscale version of this without the skin pattern the coloration and, and skin pattern are completely fiction uh, but the real story is the integument on the face and I, there's a bit of a backstory to this uh, when i was working on the horner eye monograph a few years ago at the museum of the rockies it occurred to me that uh, I should really take the texture of the facial bones seriously and, and pay attention to that and document it in detail. And I, I knew that in 2009, uh, a group led by Tobin Hieronymus published on the types of integument that produce distinct types of texture on facial bones of animals like birds and mammals and uh, and rep and you know quote unquote reptiles and so I worked with that article very closely to constrain my description of what was happening in Horneri and I was amazed to see a huge variety of textures on the facial bones of Horneri and these textures are typical typical of all tyrannosaurs so this is the basic tyrannosaur pattern and so I started to describe the textures, pay close attention to those, and I didn't have a chance to really sit down and look at skulls of other animals until we started on the short Horneri paper that we published. So to make a long story short, it turns out that the rough wrinkly texture that dominates the face of Tyrannosaurus is identical to what we see in crocodilians. So it doesn't match what we see on bird beaks. It doesn't match, you know, the smooth texture that we see on mammals. It doesn't match the hummocky, bumpy texture that we see in, say, lizards. It looks just like crocodiles. Therefore, the inference was that transfers had to have had the same type of overlying integument in order to produce this integument of flat scales. In addition to that, uh, crocodilians have bumps on their on their faces. They're called integumentary sensory organs. The tiny black dots that are painted in the picture, basically on each individual scale, right? That's right, and they represent little tufts of nerve endings under a little dome, and they increase the sensitivity of the skin in modern crocs. The reason why we included them here was that we could not exclude the possibility. Um, that they were present. So we had to include them. So they're part of the null hypothesis. I couldn't find any justification for excluding. So in other words, I couldn't justify excluding ISOs because they may be intimately connected to this integument type. And so that, so we didn't have enough information, you know, to exclude that possibility. So we included them. We might be wrong. This is a hypothesis. We need to know more about the evolution of this type of integument in crocodilians to 
answer the question, I think. Um, and we also found different uh, textures on the face. We found a very bumpy texture on the front and top of the snout on the lacrimal and jugal horns and patches on the sides of the lower jaws at the chin. And that type of texture in, in living animals indicates a covering of armor-like skin, so thick, rough skin like you'd see in a rhino. And finally, we found a raised rim around the post-orbital horn and very uh, distinct raised platform extending below that. And that sort of arrangement is evidence for a keratin sheath. And so we reconstruct a keratin sheath covering the post-orbital horn and part of the post-orbital bar. And that's strictly following the boundaries that we see on the skeleton. Now there's one last thing I should point out, and that is, and that is in our, our illustration, it looks like the transfer has a mask that stops behind the eye, right, behind the post-orbital bar. It also stops halfway along the, the lower jaw. It just stops. For, this, for the cranium, that's the limit of where that rough texture is. Beyond that point, the bones are relatively smooth, and I don't know what's going on there. And so, so we just stopped at, at the limit of our information. For the lower jaw, the pterygoideus muscle that provides uh, part the, some of the speed and power for closing the lower jaw wraps around the outside of the lower jaw. And so what that does is just eliminate the texture of the overlying integument. So it's just not there. But my intuition is that those flat scales would have extended all the way back to the jaw joint. So basically the problem here is not uh, as like whether the fact that, you know, if the fossil isn't showing anything that it's not there, it's that, that it just hasn't been preserved to tell us what is actually there or is not. Yes, for the lower jaw, it's clearer uh, why the texture isn't there, so there's a big muscle that's in the way. But for the cranium, it's less clear what's going on. And, you know, at the end of the day, this is a hypothesis based on, based on the best available evidence. And the test of this hypothesis are, is, will come from the fossil record. And I'm convinced the day will come when transfer facial skin will be found. It'll either be in North America or Asia, where mummies have come from, and we will really know. Um, but what this drawing represents is our best possible hypothesis based on the ob observable evidence that anyone can see. And that evidence is based on some pretty exhaustive work done by Hieronymus et al., working out exactly what types of integument produce what type of texture on facial bones? Um, would you mind uh, saying again what was the uh, what, what was the name of the paper you just listed? Um, the author citation is Hieronymus et al. 2009, and the title is something like um, the facial integument of ceratopsid dinosaurs. Right, sure. It's just for the reason so that I can put it on the screen for those. Um, so the viewers, uh, for those of you who are interested, the uh, paper citation is right here on the screen. So or in the link in the description. Um, right. So let's uh, carry on. Now, um, of course, uh, I have to ask the question. You know, the saying "pop the question." Um, does this tell us? the presence or absence of quote-unquote lips. Yes, it does. Um, so in crocodilians, the texture for the, these flat scales extends all the way to the tooth row. All the way. Same thing for a tyrannosaurus. So there, there's no smooth band that would indicate a different tissue type. However, what there is along the margins of the upper and lower jaws are these minute uh, vertical rows of, of foramina that would have um, permitted vessels and nerves to reach the skin. Um, well, in this case, these little rows of foramina probably supplied the gums. So you have a pretty good idea that lining the, lower, lining the edges of the jaws were gums. And so we have the features that indicate those. 
However, uh, despite that, we still have the overprint of the scaling integument. And so there's no indication for any other tissue there. So it's exactly what we see in crocodilians. And crocs have lipless mouths. And there's no reason to think transors are any different because we don't see any difference between the bones of transors and the bones of crocodilians. So in other words, basically, we're just going with what the evidence tells us. And uh, yes. until proven otherwise, the null hypothesis is uh, the as presented right now. Yes. Right. So, and uh, you have already uh, managed to answer my next question about horneri, uh, which was, of course, are there yet to be any described specimens of horneri? And you did say that you were going to have a closer look at some of them in uh, January. So yes. we'll stay tuned for that part then, I guess. And um, if you, if you uh, manage to survive this interview, then we could hopefully have you back on the channel again with an update. Um, be a lot of fun. Yeah, it will be fun. So, um, I think uh, we are quite happy with Horneri and covered more or less everything. I mean, all of these uh, things that you have just listed, that's also what you were uh, doing at the SVP last time as well, was it not? Yes, at SVP I took the opportunity to answer some criticisms uh, regarding our hypothesis of facial integument and, and sensitivity. Um, I was trying to recall what those were. Uh, the first criticism was that the, uh, the openings, the little holes in the face, um, are not evidence for nerve endings. But I did a, um, a literature review and found that dissection shows that bony foramina do emit arteries, veins, or, sorry, Dissection shows that foramina do emit arteries, veins, and nerve branches. And there's, um, in the literature, there's very clear diagrams showing branches of the, of the trigeminal nerve uh, that does lead through those rows of foramina in crocodilians and other animals. So that takes care of that criticism. Uh, the second one was that uh, face touch um, is an extraordinary claim. But it turns out that all vertebrates can feel touch with their face, and it's a trigeminal nerve that uh, that does that. And so that takes care of that criticism. Just to recap, the second issue was that trigeminal face touch was an extraordinary claim. It actually isn't because face touch is ancestral for vertebrates, so that's lampreys on up. And the hypersensitivity in crocs and probably Tyrannosaurus is, is a derived version of that. The third criticism was that uh, thermal sensation, so being, a, being able to detect um, warm and cold, is an extraordinary claim. Uh, but it turns out that from the level of nathostomes, that's sharks on, the web, on up, uh, temperature can be felt with the face. So that takes care of uh, the third criticism. And the fourth uh, criticism was that face touch hypersensitivity is dependent on the size of the trigeminal nerve. And that's, uh, and by size, um, that means the, the cross-sectional area of the trigeminal nerve. And I think that that is an aspect that should be pursued. I think that the connection between hypersensitivity and the size of the nerve is inconclusive. It's based on incomplete data. It's just based on crocodilians at this point. But I think that is an important one to, to investigate. Um, in addition to all that, um, we're not the only ones who have suggested trigeminal hypersensitivity for theropods. It's actually been suggested for Spinosaurus. Oh, interesting. So, so the Spinosaurus yeah. does come up in that regard too. It does, and Ibrahim et al. 2014 uh, hypothesized hypersensitivity in Spinosaurus, and more recently, Barker et al. in 2017 suggested hypersensitivity in Neovenator. And all three of us have sort of keyed into the dense um, distribution and high number of foramina in the snouts of these different theropods. 
So my team isn't the only one to have made this suggestion. It doesn't mean that, that we're all right. Sure. I just thought, you know, it could be that we're right uh, for the right reasons or maybe we're wrong. Um, also for the right reasons. <laughs> yes, for the right reasons. So, you know, this is early days in terms of developing this hypothesis. And I think there are more avenues to pursue it. But what we see in Tyrannosaurus is, um, at least from my perspective, matches that of crocodilians. And so there isn't any reason to think that Tyrannosaurus were any different, considering the evidence that we actually have in, that we actually have in hand. Unless, of course, later on proven otherwise. Yes, and the, and that you know the as I mentioned earlier, the fossil record will decide. 